I'm a fellow at the Center for Policy Research. It gives me an immense pleasure to welcome Professor Amit Ahuja uh, to present, his, uh, present the findings of his recently released book, Mobilizing the Marginalized. And I've known Amit for now uh, many years, but my first meeting with Amit was wonderful because he asked us a question, why did you guys join the graduate program. So everyone had a very intellectual reason. I wanted to pursue this question or that question. And Amit had a very interesting answer why he joined the graduate program, which mostly like 25-year-old youth have, right? Like going to US for different other reasons. Uh, and so Amit's book basically offers us uh, a very like nuanced analysis of why Dalit politics or Dalit political parties succeeded in some states of India and failed in others. And his argument is largely based on sequencing of political and social mobilization. And he's going to talk about that in the next 30 to 35 minutes. We're also pleased to have Professor Surinder Jodhka as one of the discussants on the book. And uh, Shyam Babu, senior fellow at CPR, as the second discussant of the book. So the format is very simple here. We'll have 30 minutes to the author. And the idea is author would present the main findings of the book, but also use those findings to sort of like do a crystal ball gazing, how the future of Dalit politics is going to look like. And I would request the discussant to also do the same, uh, not only uh, comment on the book, but also draw on their own works and comment on how the future would look like, and then we'll open the floor for the audience to ask questions. So, Amit, the floor is all yours. This okay. is the mic. Lovely. Great. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Rahul, uh, for, for inviting me here, and thank you to everyone who's here. Uh, on a cold day uh, in which you are uh, in, you know, it, so there is mobilization that I'm going to be talking about in the room. Um, can, is the mic? Yeah. Good. So yeah, and there is also, of course, mobilization on the street uh, today as, 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 we, as we talk about mobilization in the room. So uh, in some ways, uh, you know, this is probably an appropriate moment and time to reflect on what, what mobilization is about. I also want to thank Professor Jodhka and, and Sham Babu. Uh, Sham actually has known this project for a very long time. Uh, when I was a graduate student at University of Michigan, uh, I, you know, I, 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 I first reached out to Sham, and he actually uh, guided me in the, in the early part of the project. So it's, it's actually very gratifying uh, to be able to present this work in front of him. Um, uh, I, I just want to sort of, before I you know, talk about the book, um, I want to acknowledge a debt to this book and the research that went into it. Uh, a lot of the issues that I talk about in the book that I, and, and that, that I encountered during the fieldwork that I write about in the book were, were concerns that I should have known about while living in India, while growing up in India. And as it turned out that, you know, it took, you know, graduate work in an American school uh, for me to discover the side to, or, or you know, to, to Indian history, to Indian politics, uh, you know, that was just invisible. Uh, and in some ways, it it has enriched uh, my, my my understanding of the country, but also made me appreciate very deeply the possibilities of democratic politics. Uh, and you know, I, I, and I'll and I'll hopefully we'll talk about it today. But I just want to acknowledge that up front. Um, let me let me start by, you know, just you know, start with this issue of mobilization in the in the last section. Uh, Swapan brought this up. Uh, you know, whether mobilization is useful or not. Uh, you know, what is really interesting is that when we think about political mobilization and mobilization in a democratic set, setting. As, as scholars, you know, we somehow just end up treating it like a stepchild. Why, why do I say that? I say that because uh, political scientists, uh, the corner I come from, worry a lot about electoral mobilization. They, they do know that social mobilization, social movements exist, but they don't really want to understand, you know, they haven't really gone in depth into understanding the relationship between social and electoral mobilizations. And similarly, sociologists have done stellar work in figuring out how social movements work, why they arise, what their effects are, but their relationship with electoral mobilization remains under studied in, in that part of the world. 
And what is, what is really interesting about the, the kind of mobilization I'm talking about is about the mobilization of the marginalized. And here specifically I'm thinking about Dalits, uh, former untouchables, one of the largest, if not the largest, marginalized group in the world, 200 million strong. Uh, also historically, perhaps marginalized for longer than any other marginalized group that we know about, that whose politics we read about. And the fact is that in, in the last 70 years, they have mobilized through social movements, through political parties, and you know, that mobilization has produced interesting effects. When I started looking at Dalit mobilization, the first thing that, I, that, I, that, that, that struck me and that I talk about in the book is that even when we, when we look at marginalized groups, when we look at the poor, when we look at socially excluded groups, oftentimes we have drawn conclusions about their mobilization, about their participation in democracy, their inclusion, based only on their voting record, whether they show up to vote or not, and who, they, who do they vote for. And very early in my, in, my, in my field work, I realized that participation is not mobilization. Just because people show up to vote doesn't necessarily mean that they have been mobilized, that their demands have been acknowledged, and they have been recognized for, for those demands and what, where their needs are. Uh, when it comes to the marginalized, mobilization is difficult. It faces a lot of constraints. But unless the marginalized mobilize themselves, political parties don't mobilize them. They either just rely on their vote without seriously mobilizing them, or they under-mobilize them, which is to say that they don't truly acknowledge uh, their demands or respond to them. So understanding the mobilization of the marginalized was the theme of, of my work, and that's what the book looks at. And what I look at here is, is in this book is this relationship between these two different forms that mobilization can take, electoral as well as social. Now conventional wisdom, when we think about mobilization, says that where you have strong movements, you will get strong parties which are allied to them. You know, you think about the, the Hindu nationalist project, you think about the left party and move relationship with the left movements. And you know, this is not only true for India, but across the world. But the relationship between social mobilization and electoral mobilization is, is a little bit more complicated. In fact, when I look at historical mobilization of, of Dalits in India, what I ran into was a, a, a puzzle of sorts. When I looked at the states where the historical mobilization of Dalits actually began, was long-standing, you know, started as early as the late 19th century, those are the places where the leaders came from. Even today, there are more organizations, associations, activities associated with, with Dalit movement in these places. What I found that in these states, the electoral performance of Dalit parties was weak. And in fact, where Dalit parties have done well, their social mobilization has been, has been absent, largely, or has been relatively weak. Right? So this kind of, for me at least, flew in, you know, it, it flew against this conventional wisdom. It's like, what's really going on here? You know, it's where these movements are long-standing and strong. That's where I would expect the parties to do well, and they were just not doing well. And what I, what I, what I do when I look at this puzzle in the book is what I find is that actually when social movements, historical social movements precede electoral mobilization by caste-based ethnic parties of among Dalits, among a marginalized group, the prior mobilization through social mobilization actually curtails the success of the ethnic party. 
Why? Because what social mobilization does is it generates mobilizers, social anthrop mobilization entrepreneurs, it generates symbols, discourse, demands. These over a period of time get incorporated by mainstream parties, they get, they get absorbed and by the time the electoral opportunity appears for uh, an ethnic party to compete and, and to be successful, these demands have already been absorbed. These symbols have already been absorbed by different political parties. Where such mobilization has not existed, where these long-standing movements have not existed, the outcome is different. Uh, these demands, these, the need for these demands is preserved. These symbols have a lot of salience. And so when the party mobilizes the marginalized group, it is very successful in organizing them as a block. Okay, so that's, that's the general argument here that I'll be talking about. Let me sort of talk you through the, the cases that I look at. So I study Dalit mobilization across these four states. 43% of the Indian parliament comes out of just these four states. 40% of India's Dalits reside in these four states. These are states in, in the south and in the west, Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra, and in the north, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. Now we know that the Dalit movement has been long-standing and historically strong in Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra. And as compared to that, the Dalit mov movements have not been as strong in, in UP and Bihar. But the political parties, when we look at Dalit party performance, uh, that is very different. The LJP, the Lok Jan Shakti party in Bihar has done relatively well. Uh, it, similarly, the BSP has been the star among, in terms of performance, electoral performance among, among, among Dalit parties nationwide in UP. The RPI or the BSP in Maharashtra have not succeeded as much. And similarly, the VCK in Tamil Nadu has not done as well. Right. Let me also sort of talk a little bit about you know, why I sort of see these states as movement and non-movement states. Why, you know, because is it just about, you know, that the, some of these movements started early, some of these social leaders appeared early in Maharashtra, in Tamil Nadu, and, uh, you know, post-independence, really nothing has happened. That's not the case. In fact, we, the, these, uh, these movements have not only continued, post-independence, but we actually see their effects very clearly across multiple studies. And, and you know, in the book, I actual, actually gather data on movement effects. So I'm just not relying on historical information, which I do provide in a chapter, but I also look at, are there, can we see effects of these? And there are different studies with that, I, that I rely on, and I compare, you know, so, so there are studies that have shown Baba Sahib Ambedkar's pictures across, is across different states. And uh, I look at uh, what the results are. And you know, what I find is that in the movement states of Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu, far more Dalits recognize him as compared to UP and Bihar. Even though in UP, especially, the state actually had a project under Mayavati to put Baba Sahib's statues across you know, the state in many localities. So despite that, the recognition of, 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 of uh, Dr. Ambedkar is much higher. I also look at issues are related to intercaste marriage. And what I find is that the, the attitudes in, this, in, in both Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra, uh, there is far less opposition uh, on surveys to intercaste marriage than UP and Bihar. Similarly, uh, on, on religious conversion. And what I'm trying to sort of point to here is, you know, and, and also, let me, let me also, the other, other aspect that I look at is, is also just reporting of untouchability. 
caste, basic you know, discrimination by caste through a practice of untouchability. Again, far lower numbers are reported in Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra than in UP Bihar. And what I'm sort of trying to get at here is the, is the long-standing effect of what these movements have been able to do. I mean, these movements are actually attacking the caste system and its practices, right? And, you know, sometimes that has, you know, that's, that has also meant, you know, the attack on, 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 on religious beliefs. And that's why I looked at, uh, you know, the, the discourse around religious conversion. Um, you know, it has, there has been a conversation about intercaste marriage. And that is why I looked at that indica indicator. So, you know, I wanted to look at these, these uh, effects to actually establish, you know, how different these states are. Now, starting 1990s, what we see is this moment of electoral opportunity. Right, between 1990 and 2014, we see a serious fragmentation of the party system. The Congress decline is in full flow. There are coalition governments that are appearing at the state level, at the national level. There is a proliferation of political parties. And in this fragmentation appears the opportunity for caste-based parties to succeed. These are relatively smaller parties. And therefore, for them to be electorally successful, they need that kind of fragmentation. And we see this across all four of these states. We see this at the national level. And so there is an electoral opportunity for entrepreneurs, for leaders to mobilize their caste groups. And Dalit parties appear, compete across all four states, albeit with varying degrees of success. In UP and Bihar, uh, they have you know, not only been able to gather a substantial vote share, uh, they have won seats in larger numbers in the st state assembly elections, in parliamentary elections. They have become uh, influential coalition partners. And they have also been able to impact policy, you know, because of being close to power. Dalit parties in Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra have tried the same, but have not been able to achieve that level of electoral success and find that kind of space in coalition politics. So what's going on? Now, if you think about caste-based politics, and I'm thinking about not just caste, but I'm also thinking about jati-based politics. If we, uh, because across these states, when I look at these parties, I look at these parties in the light of the largest group uh, who is behind these parties. So it's the Jatavs in, in Uttar Pradesh, it's the Dusads in, in Bihar, it's the Mahars in Maharashtra, and it's the, the, the Pariyars in, in Tamil Nadu. You know, these are, these are large groups, and if they voted as a bloc, uh, they allow that party a fair amount of leeway in coalition politics, and they give that party a lot of influence. So for a caste-based ethnic party to succeed, do well, the pre fundamental prerequisite is you need your caste group, your jati, to vote as a bloc. Without that, they are not in the game, right? And we can look at parties' vote shares and say, well, this particular party gets 60% vote from this caste group, and that's block voting. Actually, it is not, because you can't deduce from vote shares or voting behavior the interest or preference for block voting. Because people could support a political party for all kinds of reasons. You have to go beyond that and actually inquire 
whether people are interested, voters are interested in voting as a bloc and making decisions based on their caste or ethnic identity. Right, and that's what, that's what I, I, I rely on. Uh, you know, I relied on the CSDS data. I also collected my, my own data that I present in the book through about 400 odd interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews, about 80 focus groups, um, and campaign surveys that I conducted uh, across these four states. Now, what I, what I show is that ultimately, you know, when you look at just this, this fundamental attitude towards caste-based voting, it varies very substantially across movement states, which is Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, on one hand, and non-movement states of Bihar and, and UP on the other hand. Um, people, voters, Dalit voters in Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra are far less inclined towards caste-based voting as compared to the voters in Bihar and UP. What is interesting is that this difference is not only, is not, you know, it's not just there for the post-fragmentation phase. And, and I look at the 2004 data I conducted, you know, I present also some, some work which is uh, from a 2016 survey, and you know this this trend is there. But what is really interesting is that you can actually trace it back to, you know, as far back as 1971, that you know this difference existed even back then, prior to the fragmentation of the party system. Right. So there is this there is this difference in attitude. A question arises: What's going on? I also ask people, do you think, you know, about questions about, you know, whether it's important to use caste to pick parties, or what, what goes into picking political parties, and caste shows up far more frequently in, in Bihar and UP than is the case in, uh, in Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra. So it's not just the interest in voting with your, with fellow caste members, but also when they think about picking parties, they think they use the caste lens more frequently, in, in these, you know, in, in, the, in Bihar and UP as compared to Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra, right? So there is a, there's a difference and I show that in the book. And the question then, you know, as I said, arises, what's really going on? Why does this difference appear? And for that, you know, I, I, I looked at how does mobilization actually happen on the ground at the locality level, right? Who's bringing people together how does you know how do people come together not just during elections but also in between elections right so i you know as i said i i looked at you know looked at issues of uh, you know so you know the mobilizers and and i find that there are far more mobilizers uh, you know and i i, I see them more uh, not so much as just brokers uh, which, which a lot of political scientists, you know, I, the way they, when they identify intermediaries, organizers, they often turn to the language of brokers. They are not; these are not folks who are just brokers. These are people who are recognized as leaders, as as respected individuals in their localities because they organize activities around the caste, around for the community, whether it's teaching, whether it's helping with with getting you know uh, issues resolved with the government. Uh, organizing religious meetings, festivals, setting up a small library, these are people who are respected because they work for the community. And the community listens to them, it organizes around them, they are, they are, they are, they are taken seriously within their localities, and as a result, they are also taken seriously and sought you know, after when it comes to political parties. Now, these people may not necessarily join political parties, but you know, they do let their preferences be known come election time. And party workers in, 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 in localities also try and ally with them. Sometimes they become party workers. Sometimes party workers try and get, get close to them. And so what I, what I find is that where these mobilization entrepreneurs have arisen, have been, have been around for a long time, they have signaled to parties that the community, the group, the locality is organized. 
So if you need to, if you have to engage them, if you need their support for elections, you need to engage them on a different footing. You can't just show up and ask for their vote. You can't just tell them that you have to vote like this or vote a certain way. You have to talk to these groups because they are mobilized, they have their demands, and you have to listen to their demands. And you have to include the people they see as respected uh, community leaders. And this process has taken hold in, in Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu for a long time. And different parties have gone into Dalit localities, uh, adopted their discourse, adopted their symbols. I looked at, I'll give you one example, the celebration of Baba Sahib Ambedkar's birthday. I found it is, it is observed across the country, across all four states. But there's a big difference. It's observed in many more localities, I found, in Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra, where parties, not just one, but multiple parties, contribute money to the celebration. Their party workers are present at the celebration, as compared to UP and Bihar, where fewer localities observe this, they, you know, have such large celebrations. And when the party that I found that showed up was generally the Dalit party. It's their party workers. Nobody else shows up. And so the point I'm trying to sort of make is that because this social mobilization is stronger, rose earlier in movement states, parties were alerted to how this group needed to be mobilized. They adopted their symbols. They, put, they had party workers who were they in these localities. In UP Bihar, the mobilization or if you want to call it that, was a very different nature. A lot of times, people who came to ask for the vote maybe came from the same village, maybe came from an adjoining village, but they were not from the same locality, and they were not Dalits. That's what I heard a lot of times from during my interviews. And so, you know, when you, when you hear that slogan, vote hamara, raj tumhara nahi chalega, that Hamara Tumhara difference has been there in, in the north for a long time. And that essentially is because a lot of the people who were, who were trying to mobilize who were the Dalits and who were asking for their votes were actually outsiders. It was the BSP, it was the LJP, it was RJD who were the first entrants into these localities in terms of being able to bring in Dalits as party workers. And telling Dalits, you know, establishing Dalit symbols in, in the political arena, establishing a Dalit discourse. And the absence of this, uh, you know, was, was very pivotal. So how does this impact block voting? Well, where different parties have come to different, to Dalit localities, and when you find multiple uh, parties are represented through party workers, and I find that's the case in the movement states, where more parties visit during elections to campaign for, for Dalit votes. I find that's the case in, in the movement states. The Dalit vote is split across multiple parties. Caste is not the only lens through which people view politics. Where this is not the case, and for, for long where this was not the case, which is in, in Bihar and UP, where the party workers were not present, where Dalit symbols were not present in politics, when the BSP and the L RJD or the LJP started mobilizing Dalits and other lower castes, these symbols, these party workers had became the face of Dalit politics. This is the first time in many villages, in many localities, that people were encountering their own voices. People like them in electoral politics. And because this had not happened, there was this 
you know, banding together effect, which was, which was there. It was basically Dalit vote was consolidated and it was, it was e consolidated far more easily in the northern states because these parties had no rivals. When Tiruma Vallavan goes into Dalit localities in Tamil Nadu, or for that matter, when, when, when the RPI goes into, or the BSP in Maharashtra, you know, go into the Dalit localities, these two, these parties are not the only ones using a Dalit discourse. As, as one person reminded me in Maharashtra, here all people wear nili which is to say everybody has a blue hat here, blue cap here, because, you know, that's the color of Baba Sahib. So, you know, there is, some, there is nothing really unique there. And that's the sort of, you know, and, that's, and that, that has meant that basically Dalit votes have been split. Okay. Um, so this, you know, to a certain extent, you know, so, so, so what, I'm, what I'm sort of arguing here is where Dalit movements were able to take hold, provide mobilization symbols, generate mobilizers, these were absorbed into mainstream political parties and they undercut the space for, for Dalit parties when they appeared in a moment of opportunity. Where this was not the case, the outcomes are very different. Dalit parties, when they came in, they were the first movers. They were the early mobilizers of Dalit, true mobilizers, because they were mobilizing Dalits on their demands, or with using their symbols, using their language, using Dalit party workers, and therefore, they were far more successful. OK. Why, sh you know, why should we look at this you know, relationship outside this, this, this puzzle of, of mobilization? You know, what's, the, what's the general sort of use, if you were to say, when you think about distinguishing between social and electoral mobilization. Because so far I've told you that there is a relationship. They are tied, they operate in the same space, they have a bearing on each other. But that relationship, the type of mobilization that you see actually has, has also, I argue in a book and I show this in a chapter, may matter in other ways also. See where people are mobilized in, at the locality level, they find it much easier to be socially vigilant. And by that I mean that when it comes to everyday problems, they can come together for a protest far more easily. In, the, in, the political, in, a, in a competitive political system, they can attract attention of bystanders, of parties, of media. And as a result, they are better even as marginalized, they are better at exerting pressure on the state. And we see, I, see, I find far more protest activity when it comes to just basic welfare goods, welfare problems, public provisions of, of, or, you know, of, of services. I find a lot of, in movement states, there's far more protest activity, small protests, 20, 30, 40 people. In, in, in movement states than is the case in UP and Bihar. What is also interesting is this issue of how this plays out. In, for Dalits in, in, in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, elections have become a lottery. If your party does well, you have access to the state and the benefits that come with it. When it does not, you're left out. And that being left out for long periods of time can be devastating for a group which is largely poor. In Tamil Nadu and in Maharashtra, it's not always clear to the party. And I'm not thinking about just Dalit party, I'm thinking about you know, Congress, NCP, Shiv Sena, BJP, because they all seek Dalit votes in Maharashtra. And similarly, the AIDMK, DMK, other smaller parties in Tamil Nadu also seek Dalit votes. And because it's, you know, 
because they are they they have support in the group when parties change after elections power alternates dalits don't lose access to the state it is not as much elections are not as much of a lottery for them as is the case in the northern states right so block voting has given them presence in politics in the north no doubt about it it has established you know it has produced leaders who have national recognition and you know we we just cannot underplay or underestimate the the power of these achievements but at the same time yeah five minutes here yeah, but at the same time it is also important to remember that these groups uh you know when it comes to welfare provision are at a disadvantage because of block voting behind their caste party something that uh you know we don't see in in the in in maharashtra and tamil nadu lastly the book also looks at this other question ultimately you know when we think about baba saab's you know initial you know sort of hope and faith in democracy to level the playing field and his warning if if that you know if if you know to the, to the to the to the nation that you know if such something like that would not happen then people would blow up the system well the question is you know we've had dalit mobilization through movement through parties they're in politics but fundamentally when it comes to discrimination when it comes to inclusion have things really changed and on this i argue that you know when it comes to social attitudes things have been much slower to change i actually provide you know evidence from a marriage market study that i did in which you know very highly sought after very similar grooms were presented uh, you know in terms of their profile to to women from different castes and these grooms as i said shared very similar characteristics the only thing that was different um, you know was their caste they were highly educated they made they you know they had high incomes but essentially uh, you know their what what i we basically they were different in caste and what we find is that the dalit grooms do fairly badly as compared to obc and upper caste grooms uh you know despite sharing the same characteristics they are far more discriminated against um can i get 2 minutes yes sir just okay so where do we go from here you know one thing that i'm sort of i try to make a case for in this that you know we when we look at electoral politics when we look at party politics we need to look a little bit beyond as a political scientist you know i'm in some ways making a plea to uh, to those to students of dalit politics and to students of of electoral politics that please do also look at social mobilization social movements uh because costs of collective action in india have dropped it have also they have dropped worldwide and that would mean that we will see more in in you know so the constraints against collective action even for marginalized groups are going to be fewer going forward you know assuming democratic conditions right and this is primarily happening because of technology we seeing a serious prolifer proliferation of of dalit social media activity we are seeing large protests appear without leadership but very effective protests uh you know they are anchored it in 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 all kinds of ways there are groups which are now around which were not around earlier for 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 dalit mobilization so it's not just party based and it will be interesting to see uh how this affects uh electoral mobilization of dalits it doesn't necessarily mean that this heightened and increased in dalit mobilized social mobilization will actually benefit dalit parties another thought that i want to sort of leave you with and i'm not going to go into uh, and i'm happy to actually look at the question of uh, dalits and and the mobilization by bjp because i do uh, deal with that a little bit in the book 
But another point I want to sort of leave you with is, which is something that I sort of uh, bring up in a paper with, uh, with colleagues of mine, Susan Osterman at University of Notre Dame, and Adnan Nasimola, who is at King's College at the University of London, where we make this point in this paper that essentially in today's electoral climate, what is really interesting is that the anti-corruption movements that have arisen, anti-corruption politics that has arisen, has, is actually incom incompatible with Dalit parties, with, Dalit, with democratic deepening. And, and the point that we're sort of making here is this, look, 2014, the election bill, or the cost was $5 billion was spent. In 2019, $7 billion was spent. Elections are becoming extremely expensive. And in this expensive climate, where there's already such a strong anti-corruption uh, wave, and you know, there's a strong anti-corruption sentiment, parties of the poor who've generally relied on practices which are deemed as corrupt just don't have the money to take on these major wealthy parties. Uh, if, if we had institutionally taken measures to control the use of money or provided state assistance to parties, that would have given them some uh, ability to compete. But as elections become more expensive, parties of the poor and marginalized, base, marginalized groups based parties are really going to struggle to compete. And that's something that I know I'll leave you with. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Thank you for presenting a wonderful social science research. Basically, a good question with great research design and something I didn't want to say earlier. But basically, uh, you have used the multi-method approach where you have experiments, survey data, you have interviews, focus group discussions, ethnographies, and you arrive at a good theoretical sort of like contribution which is grounded in uh, empirics. And Amit and I are also Guru Bhais. Uh, we share the PhD research advisor who after all of this work is going to say what's new, right? And he wants one line answer of what your big contribution is. And I think the big contribution is you talk about sequencing of political and social mobilization. Uh, now we have Professor Jodhka and Shyam Babu who are going to make some comments on, on the presentation as well as their own thoughts. Uh, let me begin uh, by congratulating Amit for publishing such a great book. Uh, thank you also Rahul for asking me to read it and come here and comment. Uh, this has been really very fruitful and very valuable uh, in some sense experience. I have read most of the books. I had to skip two chapters because I didn't have time to read every word and every page, but I have more or less kind of, you know. Um, I think uh, 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 I'm happy that uh, uh, research on caste is uh, being taken seriously by, in some sense, mainstream social sciences and by using mainstream social science language. Uh, there was a time when people worked on caste, and caste has always been, in some sense, uh, uh, studied, uh, but mostly by anthropologists, sociologists, and only those who are studying, in some sense, India's traditional life, rural life, etc., etc. And I think uh, 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 the major contribution of Amit's book is that he brings in a fresh perspective uh, to the study of caste by invoking the idea of caste being an ethnic formation. Uh, and I think this is very important because it then allows us to think of caste in a comparative perspective. It is not that we are talking only about India in relation to India and for India. So when we are thinking of caste uh, through a language which in some sense makes it available for comparative research in other democratic political systems, uh, it then also becomes in some sense a normal reality. And I think that's very, very important. My own work, I've been arguing that how uh, research on caste is stuck in this uh, uh, paradigm which I call as imperative of disappearance and we only think of caste from a modernization theory perspective that it has to go away only then we will be able to understand Indian democracy normally. And this kind of language allows us to visualize other democratic systems also having similar kind of 
uh, uh, processes uh, and, and, and ethnic formations, which in some sense are on the margins of those democracies. So India is not really unique, and I think it helps us to take um, research on caste out of what is known as Indian exceptionalism. I think that's a very, very important uh, contribution, and that is, I think, I really congratulate you for that. It was actually uh, Max Weber um, who started um, uh, with this conceptualization of caste as ethnic formations, and he also similarly uh, thinks of caste as ethnic formations which are also on the margin, right? Uh, there are ethnic formations which are, in some sense, uh, I think it's somewhere you, you talk about, they're not simply questions of differences, or diversities, but there are also questions of marginalities. So I myself talk about, you know, different kinds of diversities. You have horizontal diversities, which are simply in question of, you know, uh, differences. You have uh, people who are living together, but different. But you also have vertical diversities, and that's something which we need to think about much more. And we need to think about them as, as, as normal processes which structure inequalities. And I think it was uh, uh, in, the, in the recent... Uh, history of social sciences with the work of Louis Diumo and the influence he had on sociologists that in some sense research on caste derailed into this whole idea of Indian exceptionalism which in some sense made research on caste redundant. You don't really have to work on, on caste. Caste means all these things. It either has to be there or not there. But the point is that caste can be there in, in a variety of different forms. And you can understand that only when you use language of social sciences to study caste rather than languages of culture. So I think this cultural exceptionalism in some sense has hindered research on caste and I'm very happy that the works of people like Amit are in some sense bringing caste into the mainstream of social sciences for comparative research where we can think of caste as a normal democratic political process and castes participating as, as active agents. Um, um, I think Amit also rightly points, about, points out uh, uh, diverse disciplinary traditions, and different disciplinary traditions themselves have opened up uh, uh, questions of caste uh, for different kinds of research. For example, until uh, 10 years back, hardly any economist talked about caste. Uh, economists talked about uh, households, poverty, inequalities of wealth and income, but nobody actually, I mean, even in planning commission, people did not really think of poverty as, as, as having anything to do with caste. Poverty was an individual uh, household variable in terms of income and consumption, but not as, as communities and identities. And I think uh, that way this kind of you know, comparative political science brings in a new kind of perspective to the study of caste as, 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 as a system of uh, uh, kind of uh, social uh, uh, dynamics. I have a few critical points also, since I was also asked to kind of use my own work and how I look at it. There are two, three points that I would like uh, to submit for your consideration. Uh, one is that, you know, with this uh, economics and particularly this kind of modeling of caste coming into caste studies, uh, there's a critical research that is happening again within uh, sociology and, uh, and historical uh, sociology of caste which in some sense has, and you also rightly point out in, in several chapters about the Orientalist burden on, on understanding of caste. And the Orientalist burden actually has, that's what I was trying earlier, you only think of caste as something which is bad and something which belongs to tradition. And that Orientalist construction at some level tends to inform your own understanding of caste when you begin to describe what caste is. You, for example, in one of the first initial chapters, you begin with introducing caste through the Verna model of hierarchy. Now, this Verna model of hierarchy is something that all of us have come to accept as the only way of thinking about caste is like Manu Smriti and Manu had talked about Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, Ati Shudra. Now, empirically, anyone who works on field, and this comes out very interestingly in his own work, uh, this is nonsense, right? Uh, Varna is a model somewhere it does exist, but it is only a particular book view of caste. Empirically, when you compare Tamil Nadu with UP, caste formations are very different. In Tamil Nadu, you don't have Kshatriya Varna. In Kerala, you don't have Kshatriya Varna. You have Brahmins, you have Ati Shudras, and you have the Shudras or backwards, right, as they're called. So there are these three kind of formations, and these three formations are not, they don't correspond to the to the, to, the, to the book view of caste in the sense Brahmins are not, 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 not priests and scholars. Brahmins are the rulers. Right? Brahmins were, were, were the local rulers even in the village. They were the ones who had land. If you look at studies by people like Andre Bete or M. Srinivas, they were landlords. right? And these landlords then had their peasants who were backward classes, and then they had the 
the proletariat, so the or the bonded laborers who were who were who were who were untouchables. So you have these three class model in some sense, which also corresponded very well with three caste model, and their dynamics is very well documented in some sense, suggested also in your book, the way backward classes begin to mobilize themselves, and that creates a space for Dalit mobilizations as well and framework of deprivations in the language of caste during the colonial period and that's how in some sense caste begins to be enumerated by the colonial rulers but they go back to orientalist formation because they require that, that orientalist formation for their own reasons. And when you move to states like Bihar and UP, these are again internally very different, right? When you go to Bihar, there are pockets where Brahmins are the landlords. There are pockets where Rajputs are landlords. There are pockets where Bhumiya is landlords, right? So these are in some sense different pockets of dominance. Brahmin necessarily priest, I mean, my own area in Haryana and Punjab, if you're a Brahmin, at the most you would classify, you're qualified to be an OBC, even though they don't get listed as OBC, but in, in Karnal district or Panipat district of Haryana, if you go, they're the small cultivators. And nobody would want to be a, to be a, to be a priest, right? In my own villages, if you are a priestly Brahmin, no one would want to marry you, uh, uh, marry their daughter to you. So to be a, to be a well-status Brahmin, you have to be a secular Brahmin. So I think the way caste has been presented in this orientalist understanding is a very misleading kind of reality. And I think your empirical data very clearly contradicts that. That UP is not simply a question of mobilization being different. Structurally also caste formations are very different in UP and Bihar when you compare it to the South uh, Tamil Nadu. Maharashtra again has a different kind of system. Maharashtra also in pockets Brahmins were very powerful because they were rulers. Right? We know about Peshwas, we know about Pune University is still like that palace of Brahmins is still standing. It is also represented in movies. And uh, then obviously the local hierarchies have evolved as they, evolved, they have evolved. So there's a particular language of Varna hierarchy which is superimposed on, on, on the realities which are very diverse regionally in India by Orientalist constructions of India as land of Hindus and Hindus being all... Uh, in some sense, uh, classifiable through what Manusmriti says, and then you know colonial rulers come in and they say that you know without us you can't move out of it. So there's a whole politics of knowledge and politics of of in some sense conceptualization. So that seems to somehow remain uncritically examined in your work. And I think if you look back at that, it might help you. Uh, understand the diversities of political outcomes, electoral outcomes. I'm not just simply making a philosophical or methodological point, but it also has implications for the modeling that you're that you're doing. A related point here is the question of Dalitness. You know, the way you invoke Dalitness and the way it is generally talked about by, by economists and, and, and larger political narratives, that we simply think of Dalits as a caste group, right? Dalits are a caste cluster and Dalits are all untouchables, and Dalits should have a particular kind of identity of their own, interests of their own. Yes, at some level it is true, but again, then we also, in some sense, synonymize Dalits with scheduled caste with X untouchables. Now, these are, I think, different kinds of categories which need to be examined both historically as well as uh, at some sense critically, right? So Dalitness is, I don't think Dalit is a caste category. I think Dalitness is a political formation, very hard to equate it even with ethnic formation. Right? Anyone who says Dalit is somebody who is standing up and saying that I want my rights. So they are not asserting their caste identity. They are asking for citizenship. Right? When say I am a Chamar, then it's a different kind of assertion of Dalitness that is of Jati. So the point I'm trying to make is that within Dalitness, you have empirical units, and I think that's where you're absolutely right, as you were also discussing. Ethnic formations are these sub-communities within the category called Dalits, which are, I don't know how many, maybe nearly 1,000 all over India, or at least a few hundreds. Every state has a list of scheduled castes. And all scheduled castes are not Dalits. All Dalits are not scheduled castes. All untouchables are not scheduled castes. All scheduled castes are not untouchables. These are official classifications, various communities have been able to bully their way into the scheduled caste list. In Punjab, we had uh, um, uh, Ravidasia, not Ravidasia, uh, what was that community, Rai Six, who were able to get into the scheduled caste list because they were, they were a large community and they were bullied, they, they were able to bully their way into the scheduled caste category. Similarly, a large proportion of Dalits in South India who are not formally listed as scheduled caste because they're Christians. 
though they are part of scheduled caste, they become because they hide their religion, but technically they would not be listed as, so Dalit politics would treat them as Dalits. And as you rightly said in your book also that, you know, Christian missionaries played a very important role in, in mobilizing Dalitness in South India. So I think this uh, religion, because according to uh, official position, if you're not a Hindu, you cannot be a scheduled caste, right? So I think these nuances are very important and Dalitness needs to be invoked carefully because when we are talking about politics, we eventually talk about jati politics within Dalits, right? When we talk about Dalits in Maharashtra, we're actually talking about Mahars. When you're talking about how Ambedkar is celebrated, Charamkar don't celebrate Ambedkar as much as Mahars do. They have started doing it only in last 10, 15 years. It's when rest of the country accepts Ambedkar as symbol of Dalitness, then it goes back to um, uh, Maharashtra in a different format, right? But internally, initially, until like 1990s, only Mahars owned Dalit. When he comes to North India and everyone says that the Ambedkar is Hamara hai, Ambedkar ke through, as you rightly say that, then he becomes a symbol of, of, of Dalit assertion. So I think these are at some level uh, important point where we need to kind of make a distinction between what I would call as statist and statistical view of caste and grounded and relational view of caste. And I think these are two different. It's useful to have statist and statistical view of caste because that helps us compare uh, these categories nationally, and economists are using it uh, fruitfully, but they are also, in some sense, uh, creating confusions because they club SCST as one caste. SCST are not one caste. These are state categories, and one should qualify. Within them, there will be significant differences. If you go to Dwabba region and the Chamars, there are sometimes better off than OBCs, right? So I think inter uh, intra SC differentiations and dist differences are very critical. And this also applies to the point that you were making at the end of your presentation about the way new kind of organic formations through new kind of political entrepreneurs which are organically linked to their communities and their constant work with their communities has made these communities available for some kind of political negotiation. And very rightly you pointed out the way state becomes very critical for all communities. So they would negotiate and they would judge their own way if there is a possibility of BJP coming back to power without aligning with BJP ideologically, they would strategically align with BJP that, yeah, we'll provide, and that's what BJP did in these elections and the previous elections, how you fragment these communities, and that's why BSP could not really uh, engage in that game and, 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 and they failed, right? So I think there are various processes which starts from, say, say Dalits, goes up to OBCs, and perhaps to some extent also upper caste, where state has become a very important resource, and through democracy, accessing state via your own intermediaries, even though they are kind of more than intermediaries, as you, as you rightly, rightly point out. Just one or two minor points. Uh, um, uh, Uh, finally, uh, I think one also perhaps needs to look at when one is comparing, say, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra with UP and Bihar, and if one was to move away from this uh, kind of political language of Dalitness to the language of ethnic formations and jatis empirically, which you actually in your study do, uh, one should also perhaps look at different trajectories of middle class formation within these communities, right? There are communities, for example, Mahars, who are very successful. I mean, um, the advantage that Ambedkar uh, gave to Mahars was that a new tradition of education begins in, among Mahars. Similarly, in South India also, there are some communities where getting educated is very critical, and they also gain because of Christian uh, missionaries coming in and they helping them to get educated. And there's a process of middle class formation. And then how reservations become very, very critical for these communities to be able to mobilize themselves. When I revisited my villages in, in, in Haryana uh, in 2008-9, I saw many of the lower OBCs were actually worse off than Dalits because they neither had an ideal like Ambedkar nor did they have the quotas that, that scheduled caste had. So they did not have their own leadership. They did not have those connections with the city which scheduled caste were able to build through reservations and through then also kind of education becomes available to them. And I think these are very interesting processes looking at and the, the, the point that you're making is very, very critical, I think, that, that, that these communities have their own organic leader. Now, it's not the outside parties that are coming and mobilizing them. And that happens in North India much later. 
Though in Punjab it happens, you know, in, in 1920s you have the Manguram and, and Adhra movement, but UP Bihar in some sense is kind of left behind and it happens only in the, in the 80s and 90s and, you know, so Kanshiram has to come from Punjab to, in some sense, you know, mobilize the Chavars or Jatavs. Yeah. While, while, while in Maharashtra, again among Bihars it happens, it doesn't happen among all, all communities of Dalits, right? And Tamil Nadu and, and Karnataka also, I think it is much more vibrant. In, in Kerala also, so it's much more vibrant uh, kind of uh, uh, grounding of different communities. And I think these are kind of empirical questions which perhaps would, in some sense, strengthen your your research. And I again congratulate you for for taking us to the grounds. You know, that's where caste needs to be studied, and caste doesn't need to be studied as something which is uniquely Indian and exceptionally Indian and something that is wrong with Brahmins. And so it's not. It's it's a real reality where people kind of come together, and it happens everywhere, all over the world. Communities, societies are divided among you know dominant groups and marginalized groups. And I think this is something which really you know uh, helps us a lot in taking the research on caste forward and normalizing it as a research question for social sciences. Thank you once again. Rahul and Hamid, thank you very much for including me in this. And uh, uh, having known Amit for quite a long time, ever since he was a graduate student and having seen the kind of hard work and passion he put into this, I would not have expected anything less from this. And uh, Amit, congratulations for such a fantastic work. As you directed me, Rahul, I will confine to the question, what next? And uh, before that, I would say, I'm not really sure of uh, the matrimonial data Amit has given in the, uh, I'm not questioning it, but uh, I'm a bit non-committal on that part. Where I am critical is he could have added one more chapter, which is a tall order to ask, but uh, he simply let the uh, Dalit political parties off the hook for their responsibility for the kind of mess we are in. So I'll confine to that uh, part of uh, the thing. You know, for almost 10 years, ever since, I mean, whenever I thought of uh, Amit, one imagery haunted me. And finally, a couple of months back, just I unburdened myself by writing a newspaper article on that, which is soon after, I think maybe it is 2007 or 2012 election, I met Amit and he said that something really strange is happening in UP, especially among uh, Dalit Bastis. During elections, Virtually every community and every household is visited by not one, almost all parties and candidates. But Dalit Bastis were completely deserted. Nobody would bother going to them, no candidate. Non-BSP parties wouldn't go because they were certain they wouldn't vote them. So they would rather concentrate on their energies elsewhere. Similar, similarly, BSP candidates wouldn't go there because they knew these guys would vote them. I thought this is a kind of self-imposed ghettoization of the community. And with the result, even when BSP came to power, forget about all the emotional uh, rhetoric, there was no any specific policy design, for example, let us not even talk about policies. Most ethnic parties don't even have proper election manifestos. They contest Lok Sabha elections, but they have no idea of a foreign policy. How are you going to deal with Pakistan or a SARC or whatever it is? Their idea is that we have captured this part of the electorate we will expand by having candidates from other groups or have some alliances. We will come to power. Empowerment for them meant just coming to power. Whereas a proper role for ethnic parties and especially Dalit parties is to transcend identities, to create a secular identity around citizenship, around equality, around civil liberties, 
economic development, regional development, no such thing. Have you ever come across a phenomenon called a Brahmin political party? I remember Dr. Ambedkar called Congress a Brahmin Banya party, and later we started using the same uh, term for BSP, uh, BJP. But even then, these parties had a national outlook, a secular uh, framework. They talk about foreign policy, they talk about trade, they talk about investment, they talk about all kinds of issues. But to the best of my knowledge, especially BSP, let me confine to that part. I, I want uh, Amit's response to this. Why would you continue with ethnic mobilization, including uh, Muslim mobilization, which we discussed in the morning, when this mobilization doesn't lead to some kind of transcending identities? trapping the victims within their ghettos, not showing any way to come out of that. I would say that is a major question. Uh, probably somebody else or Amit should be writing a different book about where exactly these ethnic uh, mobilizations uh, failed. And again, you talked about the uh, movement states and non-movement uh, states. Especially for Dalits, what happens is when you go for social mobilization, social movements, the reference point is caste. And uh, the way they articulate their demands is a bit antagonistic. Mark Gallanter reported that way back in 1970s that even in reserved constituencies, if a Dalit candidate really represents or articulates Dalit's interests is unlikely to be elected. So the very fact that you have a social movement may go against the community. So if directly political mobilization, the way it happened in UP Bihar, unless that political mobilization has a larger agenda, even Ambedkarite agenda, actually I would say having a good Ambedkarite agenda would have redeemed these parties from the kind of ignominy they heaped on themselves. I would put one last point, which is, for my own work, recently I have been reading T.H. Marshall's uh, 1949 uh, thing, where he talks about civil citizenship, political, and uh, uh, social, which came in West in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. Unfortunately for us in India, the civil citizenship just suddenly came without asking. Uh, with, uh, with the introduction of IPC. We didn't even uh, really notice. And political citizenship also, we didn't really fight for that. Suddenly we got the universal adult franchise. Now, we started social aspects of citizenship without really having much regard for the other two aspects. Uh, social seems to be much more uh, contentious. Do you think this kind of topsy turning the order created the kind of situation we are in now. And uh, there are other f f small, small points for me. One is, you know, the very identity trap, your chapter nine. Uh, I've been grappling with that for quite some time. Like, we have certain policy or constitutional uh, remedies uh, to help the scheduled costs or scheduled tries. Both are one and the same. What is, you have to assert your social inferiority to get some economic benefits. So you can get a reservation, but at what cost? You have to say that you are inferior. Now even the, at the Supreme Court, the kind of debate on criminal they're having, they are not recognizing reservations as a kind of right, a right of representation, but as a kind of dole out. Once you reduce it to dole out, weakest, and the poorest would get. But the original design of the Constitution for all these measures is signaling effect. You create icons, you say that just like Ambedkar, who could go to Columbia University and come back and show that given the opportunities, a Dalit could also be like anybody else or even better than that. But we reduce that to a kind of poverty elevation uh, matter. So, there are other points, but I would like to stop here. I want to know how, 
how you regard the failure of not just BSP, let, let me tell you, SP, RJD, even LJP, for example, without an alliance with one of the dominant parties, it cannot succeed in uh, Bihar. So to that extent, on its own, probably BSP did succeed occasionally, yeah. but LJP cannot succeed at all. But all these parties, what they have done? They delegitimized political mobilization by the marginalized because they have not delivered even on one part. Basic land also, or land art also, they haven't uh, delivered. So, especially with regard to 2019 elections, the way they sliced the pie in such a fine fashion, not just caste, even sub-caste level they have gone. Talking about ethnic mobilization by Dalits, again, this is not just Dalits, it's all sub, uh, dominant sub-caste, Malas in uh, Andhra Pradesh, Parias in Tamil Nadu, Mahars in uh, Maharashtra, they seem to be leading the movement so far, but the small groups within the larger basket have turned against them now. And what next? I'll stop there. Thank you. So, Amit, uh, two minute response to Professor Jyotka and two minute response to Shambhal. Okay. Okay. So Take I'm this. Gonna, I'm going to keep this really short. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. Please, please go ahead. Okay. So, very, okay. <laughs> Uh, you know, firstly, thank you so much for those very, very incisive comments. Um, you're, I, let me just sort of start by saying you're absolutely right on everything that you've said. Um, I, will just, uh, I will just offer a few clarifications. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right, Professor Jodhka. You know, when I looked at, uh, I was very conscious of how caste is structured uh, differently across these, these states. And in some ways, the point that I make right up front in the book is that, look, you know, irrespective of, 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 of uh, the way caste is structured, the fact is that across all these four states, these particular groups, and I, you know, I, in a, yes, I, I do use the word Dalit, but I also clarify that, you know, I am, I'm looking at very specific, large, politically influential jatis that back these parties. Um, so, so you know, so, so that, that's that, that 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 is that is that is very much the case. But the fact is that in all four of these groups, these are historically marginalized, discriminated against, and have faced untouchability. At the end of the day, these are groups which are at the bottom of these different-looking caste structures. Uh, that being said, you're right that you know if the caste structure, structure is is different, that may have effects. And, and you know, so in some ways, for the sake of comparison, that's, that's a thumb rule that I work with, that I look at the most marginalized group across four states, uh, which, is, which is in politics. Uh, so, you know, so that, that's, uh, and in, as far as Shams, uh, you know, really tough question, which is to say that, sure, you've got the, um, the in some ways, you know, you've got the, the symbolic achievement uh, you've got the emotional satisfaction of successful Dalit parties, prominent Dalit leaders uh, with national acclaim. Uh, what comes beyond that? Uh, can we go beyond what political scientists call descriptive representation? And the limitations of mobilization in that regard are actually very, is, is very sobering uh, because, you know, the people, uh, uh, you know, Simon Chauchard, uh, uh, you know, colleague of mine in, in political science and, 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 and Francesca Gensinius, they've actually looked at institutions, these, the reservation policies that have been put in place and looked at their effects, and they find marginal returns. They don't find very, very major returns in terms of welfare for, for Dalits. And so if, even if mobilization and successful political mobilization, when you have this, you know, when you have state power, Yields, uh, you know, limited results. Um, you know, then that that is that is that is troubling. And I think one reason we must remember is that ultimately, you know, when it comes to accountability uh, for a voter, when it comes to, even when you have your own party uh, in power, if you're poor, holding your own party becomes really really difficult. Um, and 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 you know because that's just you know when it comes to other, you know wealthier more people with more groups. They find it easier to hold, hold their elected representative, gov state officials, uh, more accountable. But the fact also remains, on top of that, 
if you're poor and, as, and, and then you're also just behind one group, one, sorry, one political party, and so in some ways, in some ways you've, you've ruled out political competition for your vote, then the, con then the consequences uh, can be, uh, you know, as in terms of what we see in UP and Bihar. Uh, there is a little bit of that that, that we do see. Um, you know, you know what, what do we, where do we sort of go from here? Is it, is it just that, uh, you know, it's, it's just the electoral mobilization? Uh, you know, you know, it does, is it sort of then completely fruitless? No, it's not. I think if, 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 if uh, you know, the sort of trends that we are now seeing, as even in, even in, in places like UP and Bihar, as we see greater social mobilization of Dalits, uh, as we see more movements arising uh, among Dalits, uh, you know, there is more political activism. Uh, in some ways, what these parties, the one good thing they have done is they have shown the path to political power. They have shown the usefulness of, of politics in some respects. And so if you go to Dalit localities, you do find boys who, who, who want to be influential in their own localities, in their own districts. And for that, if, if it's not the BSP, it's not the LJP, then they are, they are, they are fine about working for other parties. And so in that sense, uh, you know what we are seeing. You, what we may see is greater competition, or, or for for Dalit votes. And on the other hand, a greater accountability within the group, uh, with some of these movements and these new leaders holding these politicians and their parties a little bit more accountable than has been the case in the past. <laughs>